What is up? What is up? What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Michael Balco Show. It's your host, the one, the only, Mike Balco. But this is not about me today, y'all. Today, I'm super excited to announce my guest. He is a professional football kicker who has kicked in six different leagues across his career, a current NFL free agent, and one of Pat McAfee's personal recommendations, my boy Taylor Russolino. How we doing, my man? Doing well. How you doing today? Blessed and highly favored as always. <laughs> like First, it. Yes, sir. First and foremost, we got to rep the hometown. We got to rep the area code. Tell us about your hometown, where it's at, what makes it so special. Um, born and raised in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, incredible, incredible place to to grow up. Um, food, culture, sports. Um, you know, we're, we're diehards down there from the moment we uh, can actually follow a television till till we get old. So um, I was very thankful to to have sports in my life and to have a, a great foundation in which led me to to the pursuit of everything athletic that I do and love. Um, had two great brothers that was that were able to push me athletically and competitively. And, and uh, it, it was good. I mean, I loved I loved my childhood. I was very blessed, very thankful, um, you know, was able to enjoy it. And and, you know, it provided me with with who I am today, I believe. So I'm very thankful for my childhood. Grew up in uh, New Orleans, love the city, love the culture, um, love everything about it. And it's my hometown. So. Who that? Who that, baby? I'm a Saints fan as well, so it's lit. All right, we got to get you on the Saints. We got to get it. We got to make it happen. <laughs> one day, one day. Facts, facts. So tell us about your high school football career, uh, your recruiting process, and how you ultimately ended up at Millsaps College. Um, so I was a, a senior at Rummel, um, or Archbishop Rummel High School, right there in Metairie, Louisiana. Um, was a big time soccer player coming through high school, played everything from club to the high school level competitively, um, was able to to perform at a level to where I was gaining some interest through college um, as a soccer player. And it was my senior year that the team needed um, a place kicker. We had a we had a very good football team. We're always kind of known for our our team, our our quality, our athletes. Um, our head coach at the time. We have a great program over there. Um, so it was, I think it was the second game of the season. We had a phenomenal kicker and punter at the time who was also playing for Team USA Baseball, the junior team. He had to go to Cuba for a tournament. The team needed a, a fill-in place kicker. We were at PE one day on like a Tuesday or Wednesday playing gotcha, you know, a little basketball game in the gym. And the soccer coach and the football coach approached me, both saying, Taylor, this is our situation. And do you have any interest in potentially kicking a football for the football team as soon as four days from now? Um, I was kind of like, I mean, let's go. I mean, I can I've kicked soccer balls thousands of times. I can kick them far I can kick them high. Do you have any cleats? Let's let, let's go out to the field and and let's test this. Let's see if it's even going to work. So so they pulled me from the basketball gym to the uh, football field that very moment, and we go out there. I'm wearing, I think they grabbed um, a size like 12 and a half cleats from actually a buddy of mine on the team. Threw those on, went to the field, and had about three or four different coaches giving me what they thought was direction and. Uh, proper coaching in regards to steps, swinging and all that. I took it with a grain of salt. I went back there. I'm not sure if I was three steps back, four steps back, two over, whatever it was. I just went back there and started kicking. And, and the leg strength was was evident um, from soccer. It was translating the football. I was, I was kicking 50-plus yarders that day, just literally just driving the ball, kicking as hard as I could, no technique, no height, nothing pretty about it but I was showing that I could get the job done. So, so went home that night, um, consulted with the family, the parents, and uh, made a decision to, to join the team that next day. Um, Cause it was funny. Cause I had ACT prep like that week. And I, I put that to the side and was like, look, I'm gonna give 
I'm going to give this football thing a shot because we had our biggest game against Archbishop Shaw, which is a rival of Rummel um, in the Boys Catholic League down in the city of New Orleans. We're playing at our home stadium in front of, I'd say, around 10,000 people. Um, so here we are. I, I dress up. I dress out for the game. Um, did not get the starting nod. The team wasn't going to say, you know, all right, you're doing kickoff number one. You know, they didn't want to put me out there. I didn't honestly probably didn't have the confidence to go out there and start and and play a full game that had quite a quite a bit of meaning behind it. Um, so the game goes on. It's a close game, back and forth battle. It comes down to I think three three or four seconds left on the clock. Um, the coach, we're down by two points. Um, coach Jay Roth is our head football coach at the time, comes up to me on the sidelines. This little peewee guy, I mean, half my pads are probably on backwards. He comes up to me and he's uh, kind of gives me a nod. He's like, hey, we, you know, we have a 40, I think it was a 42-yard field goal or 41-yard field goal, three seconds left. He's like, hey, man, you want to – this is you. If, if you want this opportunity, I'm going to send you out there and you put this ball between the uprights and give this team a W. I looked at him with, you know – Coach, let's go. This is this is what I'm here for. I didn't I didn't come here to just sit here and, and warm this bench. I came here to to perform and to help this team win. So so I went out there, 41 yard right hash, snap hold, kick the ball. Um, and if you're familiar in, in high school, the uprights are fairly short. They're not as long as or tall as say NFL uprights that reach to the ceiling. You know, they're pretty short. So I kicked the ball from the right hash, goes over goes over the left upright. Um, at, at the moment, even the referees hesitated in regards to what's the call, what do we say? I mean, literally directly over. Um, my entire side of the fans, our head coach, our, our team is already halfway to me to tackle me, to, you know, throwing the headsets off, cheering up and down was a, was a, a great kick that I'm sure from the side angle, side angles, Probably looked like it went right through the middle. As the refs continue to hesitate, unfortunately, the refs called it no good. Um, oh, that's crazy. You can still go back to the film, and it's questionable. But they called it no good, um, and that was the first time my foot hit, my foot came contact to a football. That ball probably would have been good from 50-plus yards had it been straight. But even so, I showed, I showed at that moment that I was – I was capable of doing this. And, and that feeling that I got being out there with the crowd roaring with the game on the line. I mean, that came to me as if like, I, I, I love this crowd. Like, this is awesome. This is what I'm built for. This is whatever this takes me next. I'm ready. Um, so that was game. That was the first game. And the only game that I really got to kick a field goal in aside from a one more game that I played and then actually set the record for the most PATs in a game. I had nine uh, extra points against one of our our opponents later in the season, and uh, and then that was it. That was that's the story of basically my high school football career, um, which basically led led me to to making a decision as a senior. Okay, well, now we have some soccer potential, um, and then in, as uh, as Christmas break rolled around after that. After that fall football season, I had went to a Ray guy kicking camp at Southern Miss University and and put on a show out there. I was kicking against kids that, you know, were all all state, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, um, Mississippi. You know, these guys with two or three years of experience. I went out there and was competing against them and, and beating the hell out of most of them. Um, so at that point, I had a couple, you know, a couple independent kicking coaches kind of reach out and and give me some advice, be, you know, kind of push me in regards to, Hey, I mean, you could potentially play this at the next level. Um, what, whatever that level is, I had no idea. I was, you know, I just wanted to, to continue to, to play sports in college, whether it was football or soccer, I was going to be happy either way. Um, and then I ultimately made the decision to uh, pursue football with, with the guidance and advice of my current kicking coach, John Carney, who is a, a saints legend. Um, so that whole story is, is ironic, but, but that's, that's the gist of my high school career. It was short. It was sweet. It, uh, it, it allowed me to, 
show myself that I had the ability to do this at a high level and, and I was ready for what was next. <laughs> yeah. John Carney is a freaking legend. That's crazy. He is. So, so how, how does it, how does like the recruiting process with that? Like you didn't play too much in high school. I think you said you played two games. So like, how, right. how do you even like, is it just like pure, just like John Carney said, yo man, I can play at the next level. So it's just like, boom. Or how does that kind of work? It, so yeah, so him, him and I just came across each other's path at the open house at Rummel. Um, his son had actually been, I think he was in eighth or ninth grade at Rummel High School. Um, so he was able to watch me practice, and that's what led him to come to chit chat with me um, during that open house. But once I went to that Ray guy kicking camp, um, I had begin getting letters from from some of the smaller local area schools as in regards to the southeast region. Um, Schools like Millsaps and, and Rhodes, um, Rhodes College, Louisiana College, you know, a, a handful of D3 programs. Um, I actually did speak to, you know, a guy at Alabama and a guy at Ole Miss, um, guys in the recruiting department in regards to a potential walk-on spot. So so I, I may have had some opportunity to go to a bigger school that would have probably led me to having to compete against five other Division One caliber kickers that had played plenty of high school. So, so I ultimately decided to choose Millsaps, which was a much smaller school, um, but allowed me to, you know, my parents pushed it a lot due to the educational aspect of the school. The football program was incredible at that time under the guidance of coach Dubose and some of the talent we had. Um, so, so making that ultimate decision to go to Millsaps was was one that took forever. I don't think I decided where I was going to school until like June. I think Jeez. training camp was like a month away. Um, so that was a, a big, a big decision that, that I had made amongst everybody and who was kind of in my corner. And, you know, I, I haven't looked back since, um, but I wasn't really recruited much, but like I said, a few small schools and took advantage of that. So yeah, led me to Bill Saps college. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. You were you were a beast there too. Three time All Conference selection, set multiple records for the school. What kind of pro interest did you garner while you were at Millsaps? Um, I mean, throughout my career, so my my best year was my junior. Um, I think my junior year, or but anyway, so yeah. Each year, I progressively kind of got better. Senior year was okay, nothing too crazy, but continued to uh, to put out good numbers and and to make some kicks. <clears throat> Um, I had a few teams reach out through senior year at Millsaps, and that was most likely because I had a few. We had a few coaches on the staff that had some NFL connections, and and that was kind of the beginning of me being my own agent. Um, you know, what just prospecting myself, being persistent, just reaching out. That was literally the beginning of it all for me. And now I've been doing it for ten years. You know, aside from an agent. I do a lot of it um, myself. I'm persistent and I reach out to guys. So, so I had a few teams coming out um, or coming in regards to contact me or just learning a little bit about me, seeing if I could really hang with some of the bigger, um, the bigger division one kickers. And, but then unfortunately throughout my senior year, I was actually kicking. Um, I wouldn't say major, but, but a pretty big injury that eventually led me to getting surgery um, in the summer after I graduated college. So that kind of put me out for, you know, a good 10 to 12 months. And, and then at that point, it's like, well, well, shit, do I really, do I keep doing this? I just had, I just had a hip label tear in my right kicking leg or, or is this the end? Um, but just seeing myself compete at some of these summer camps um, against some of the most elite kickers in college football, there was something in me telling you know, there was something inside of me saying, hey, you know, this is just a beginning. You had the talent, get healthy, get motivated and uh, let's get to work. And and that's exactly exactly what I did. Um, so. So that's kind of where it began. Um, but, yeah, Millsaps put out a great platform for me and it was a great experience, was able to learn from some of the some great coaching, um, some great players. We had an incredible roster for a Division Three football team. Um, so it was fun. It was always fun when you win, and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, that's for sure. Yeah, that just goes to show, man, it doesn't matter what, what conference you play in, what division you're playing in at the next level, man. If you're good, they'll find you. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Right? 
kicking's kicking. I mean, yeah. you can kick high, you can kick far. If you can kick it straight, I mean, th that's the objective, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you played for four different arena football teams before you got that shot in the CFL in 2017. How did that opportunity come about? And then how difficult was that transition? Obviously, you kicked outdoors in college, but you had to go back indoors for the next like four to five years. What was it like having to go back outdoors and then on like a different type of field as well in the CFL? Um, well, yeah, I guess making that adjustment back outdoors wasn't wasn't ever too easy. I mean, every time I kick, every time we train, it's essentially outside. Um, not many, you know, in those parts of my career, I didn't have access anywhere indoors or anything. Um, but kicking indoors is is awesome. I mean, it, it leads you to fine tuning every bit of your technique. The uprights are, I, I, I want to say it's exactly half of the NFL upright. So precision, accuracy, those are huge. And uh, the, the biggest kick in, in indoor football or arena football is, is the extra point. I mean, you're going to get anywhere from five to maybe eight or nine to 10 of those a game. So if you go hundred percent or if you miss two or three, that, that could be critical. So really, really the ability to, to just focus on precision, 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 and not, not having to worry about these, you know, a 56 yard field goal or anything long like that, just, just executing the technique and putting that ball between those skinny uprights. But arena football is a blast. It's a quick game. It's fast. Um, a lot of action, which I know as a sports fan, as football fans, uh, that's what you, that's kind of what you want. Um, and then, yeah, making that adjustment from that from that tiny field to then the CFL massive field um, was pretty was pretty funny. But it was I mean, the CFL field is is an adjustment in regards to punting. So that's kind of like the biggest thing, you know, because the field's like maybe six yards wide on each side. But uh, but, but getting out there and coming from the arena league helped me helped me outdoors tremendously again, just going back to the whole technique and becoming more consistent and more accurate and focusing on the details. I mean, that helped progress me each and every year I've been a kicker. So, so it was a great, it was a great asset to my career, um, which went to the CFL and to where I'm at today. That's awesome, man. That's a, that's crazy. I guess I never thought about it like that, where it's just like, yeah, man, you got to like really be accurate as a kicker yeah. in the arena ball because like you interview like other people or you talk to other people and they're just like putting up like eight touchdowns a game. And it's like, well, you're playing on like a 50 yard field, but like from, yeah. the, kicking, from the kicking aspect, it's like the same thing, except it's just harder. It's really kind it's, of all it is. It, it really is. Yeah. It and is. then you have the, you have to play the roof too. We used to have an arena team here in a uh, Erie. Eerie yeah. explosion, I believe, yep. is what they used to be called. And like I, I feel like, I think when I played in Marion, Marion, Ohio, which was my very first team, I think the eerie explosion where was in that league or was, I think we probably met before, which is insane <laughs> to think about. Right. I went to like every game. That's insane. Okay. It's a small world. <laughs> in the CFL, you were asked to kick and punt. Um, what kind of punting experience did you have prior to that? And what was that entire CFL experience like as a whole? Um. So my senior year at Millsaps, I did take on both duties. I uh, I punted and kicked field goals, kickoffs, and punts. So I had so I had I had a little bit of experience. And then after college, once I was healthy and all that, I did practice punting. Um, I added that to continue to sharpen that tool in regards to a potential CFL contract. Because um, at that time, I mean, I was. I was just trying to progress up the ranks professionally and um, the CFL was essentially kind of a next step for me. And it was a, a big step. And I, I knew to get there and to succeed there as an American specialist, the ability to punt would only help you. Um, so I continued to get better at that, continued to work at that. And then, yeah, the, uh, when I got signed to Montreal in 2017, I think it was like a Tuesday and it was like 85 degrees here in uh, Southern California where I live now. And, I left Tuesday or Wednesday and we were playing that Saturday in Saskatchewan. And it was, I, I want to say it was like anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees um, and 20 mile an hour winds. And it may have been the coldest I've ever been in my entire life. Like <laughs> I felt like I just walked into like a, 
a freezer at the local, like at the grocery store. Like it was so cold that I didn't, I mean, I was just trying to like make sure my cleat didn't break on the football or something. But so when we, when I played in those, in that game, um, the team we were on, we weren't the best that season in uh, Montreal. They weren't doing too well. Therefore we had to punt a lot. Um, I punted 10 times in my first CFL game. My, my first kick was a 47 yard field goal, put it right down the middle, hit, hit, I think another close one, but then punted 10 times. And that was tough of the, of the 10, I'd say, I'd say seven or eight of them were, were very respectable and good punts, quality punts. Um, but there was definitely one or two that I wish I had back. And then, uh, and then that second game we were playing, um, in Hamilton, final game of the season, even windier. And again, 15, 20 degrees, and it was cold. In that game, I punted nine times. So my two final games in the CFL, I punted 19 times. As primarily being a place kicker, it was tough. It was a, it was a battle. It, it was something I knew I could do. I just had to trust it. Um, that second game, I did bobble a snap. But I did uh, I did make up for it in regards to picking it up and was able to get the kickoff. Wasn't the best kick, but hey, I got it down. I didn't get I didn't get embarrassed or tackled in the end zone for a uh, safety or anything. But so so those two games right there definitely humbled me in regards to punting in the CFL in the middle of December or late November, whenever it was. But but it was not easy. But like I said, that's that's another step towards towards where I'm at today and for that I'm thankful. So it was an awesome opportunity getting up there and, uh, and playing, playing with the big boys in Canada on the, uh, on the cold turf. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, in the adjustments, a lot of people, when they think of like kicking and punting, they kind of partner it together, but it's two completely different games. I mean, yep. It's, it's wild. I mean, I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> I just, two yeah. different swings. Yeah. Completely different. Um, so after your stint in the CFL, you got a chance to go dominate in the XFL. Um, you did. You definitely did. You went nine for 10, set an XFL record with a 58-yard field goal. Um, what was your XFL journey like as a whole? It was it was incredible, to say the least. It, it, it's, it was what I had been kind of dreaming for and wanting for in regards to the ability to join a team – go through training camp, build that cohesion with my, with my unit, the offensive line, the snapper and holder, you know, have a few weeks to settle in with them. And then, and then to be able to take that practice and to put that product on the field and then execute to me, that is, that is the epitome of, of a dream for me. I mean, that's what I'm dreaming of every week, every year of the NFL. That's kind of what I've always wanted. Um, as I was progressing up professionally and, and, and it's kind of what I tell coaches and organizations, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to be thrown into a situation where, you know, you may get one day of practice and then you're called upon a game or two um, and they expect perfection. It's, it's much easier in regards to building that confidence um, and just, just getting the reps when I, when I was given the ability to, like I said, just to build that, um, that camaraderie with my unit and, and to just trust the snapper and to trust the holder and to go out there on a game day, having that sense of security and sense of trust and then to execute. It was, it was awesome. Um, the XFL was a phenomenal league run by great people, great coaches, great staff, great players. I mean, there's probably a dozen or so guys in the NFL right now. So the talent was there. Um, the fan base was there in St. Louis. It was nothing short of an of an NFL organization. Um, but the XFL was amazing. I'm super thankful for it. E extremely, you know, extremely honored to have been given that opportunity. And, and it was a testimony to all the hard work I'd put in up to it. So it, it was nice seeing seeing that come to fruition and, and being able to execute, like I said, for those five games. It was unfortunate we got cut short. Um, but I'm glad that I, I'm glad for every moment I was able to put that blue and white on and, and represent St. Louis. So it was awesome. I love the XFL. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait till it comes back. It's going to be right? exciting for sure. About a year from now. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And, man, we got to talk about this. You know we have to talk about this. Pat McAfee, man. We got to talk about the bromance here. <laughs> Pat McAfee, super public about his admiration of you, your story, your journey. Um, and, he, I mean, you guys, I'm, I'm assuming, met whenever you were in the XFL. Um, how did you guys meet? And then did you ever believe he would ultimately end up helping you land a gig in the NFL? Um, so we had, well, put it this way. I had met him years ago at a Coles kicking camp. Uh, he was maybe five, six years older than me. Had no idea who I was, but anyway, so I had met him. That was years, years prior to the XFL. And then we go, um, we're playing in Dallas week one of the XFL, um, in globe life park at the MLB stadium, beautiful setting first game of the season. He had the sideline reporter job for ESPN that game. Um, so we were we were out there pregame warming up, you know, probably an hour or so, half hour before the game. And he's out on the field. I mean, him being a specialist, he wanted to come out there and, and see the specialist warm up. He had known a couple of the guys. He knew Marquette pretty well. Um, he had some familiar faces that he was kind of touching base with. So as I'm warming up, kind of kicking – kicking off the sticks and then kick and snap and hold um, with the operation. He just, he was just observing. And uh, after, after probably a dozen or so kicks or once I completed my warm up, he took me aside and formally introduced himself to me, um, told him it was, it, it, you know, an honor to have him on the field calling our game. And one of the things he said to me was, he was like, man, I am honestly, he's like, I feel like an idiot for not knowing who you are. I was like, I mean, I, I was just kind of saying, like, look, man, I've, I've been around. You know, I'm a pretty pretty low-profile guy in regards to the the kicking world. Haven't made it to the NFL yet, but but I'm here, and I'm here for a reason. And he was like, look, you're, like, you're hitting one of the purest balls I've ever seen. I mean, he was just – he was overly excited about, you know, about how I was kicking that day. Um, so we had met that, you know, like I said, beginning of the game. And then that game I had a 48-yarder. I think about like four or five minutes left to, to essentially secure the game. And it was the first time I stepped on the field because we didn't kick extra points. So it's like, well, I'm waiting all game to get on this field. And then there it was a 48 yarder. Um, a, a, like I said, to, to give us a two possession lead. And, and then we chatted a little bit after the game, he was, uh, took some pictures together. He was hanging out with some of my cousins and my brother, um, my fiance at the time. So it was, uh, so he was a, an incredible, an incredible human to be around. And then once the XFL folded, you know, I've always been kind of a fan of his. I've always watched, watched the shows. I'll listen to them um, even still to this day live or some of the segments. And I think I was going kicking one day and I just, I heard myself on the show. And I mean, we had never talked about, Hey man, is there any way you could potentially reach out? Or I, I never mentioned anything like that to him. He was just showing me love, you know, from based on what he saw. And um, and I, I mean, I, I wish I could thank him more than I've already have. I mean, I've you know, I, I, there's it, it was an incredible to, to be able to 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 get to get my name out on a platform like that. And obviously a guy like that has, I mean, tons of connections. So him and I begin to chat. Um, you know, we would communicate throughout the NFL season last year, um, even before then. Um there were quite a few struggles throughout that season. And uh, he, he had played for a specific coach in Indianapolis that had now coached in Denver, who he had a, a phenomenal relationship with and still does to this day. And uh, he's one of the guys that um, Pat, Pat McAfee had reached out to on my behalf. He had reached out to a, to a handful. Um, but coach Tom McMahon is the gentleman I'm referring to um, the special teams coordinator for the Denver Broncos and uh, and he took liking to it. And uh, yeah, like you said, that 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 essentially led to my my NFL call up. Um, and, you know, because of him, it was, you know, and obviously it's a lot that goes into it. But, yeah, I'm extremely thankful for everything that he did for the words he put out there, the promotions, the, you know, talking about some 30 year old kicker with long hair. It was it was awesome. So extremely, extremely thankful for that. Um so yeah, led me to uh, accomplishing a dream. That's for sure. 
Yeah, man. There was also a ton of hard work you put in. Let's let's also make sure we mention that. Yeah. It's not just yeah, yeah. because Pat McAfee sure. said it. You know? For sure, but, for sure. But to get into the NFL, man, like you need a break. You need mm-hmm. somebody pushing you. You need somebody, you know, if you're not this top quality draft pick and you're a street free agent specialist such as myself, I mean, it, it takes it takes, you know, somebody throwing that extra punch out there for you and 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 he did that. So yeah, com- combining all that together, the hard work, the tenacity, the talent, it was it was a recipe for success. So facts, facts. <laughs> December 7th, 2020. That's the day you were added to the Denver Broncos practice squad. Ultimately, you were able to start in place of Brandon McManus when he fell into the COVID-19 protocols. What was your entire NFL experience like? Um, I mean, first of all, dream come true. It was I mean, me. Me stepping into an NFL facility, um, driving in every morning to meetings in a car to work um, with a gate code that allowed me to drive right into the parking lot of the Denver Broncos organization. I mean, I felt it was amazing. I felt, you know, I felt like first off, I felt like I belonged. I felt like it was it was home for those five weeks for me. It was it was again going back to the it it was a testimony of everything leading up to that. It was um, incredible to be able to to step on the field, to wear that NFL shield, to to hear coach, you know, guys like Coach Vic Fangio and Tom McMahon and Pat Schumer and some of these some of these, you know, NFL legendary type coaches. And to be on the same football field as guys like Von Miller and and Melvin Gordon and Jerry Judy and, you know, Sam Martin and and. Jacob and some of those guys. I mean, the organization was world class. They treated me as if I had been there since day one. Um, and then, so basically, as I signed on as the practice squad, um, was the practice squad kicker for the first couple of weeks. And and being in that position with COVID um, ramping up, I was separated from the actual kicker and punter and snapper. I was separated from the whole team. So. So on Wednesdays and Thursdays, I would go out there on the football field before the actual team practice. I'd go out there with Tom McMahon, just me and him one on one um, twice a week for five weeks. So, hey, I had 10 one on one practices with a very, very respectable special teams coach, a guy who's been around Adam Vinatieri, you know, Cody Parkey, Pat McAfee, you know, guys who have had all pro type careers and every practice I went out there with him honestly was flawless for me. It was, it was each day from, from day one to the last day I wore that Broncos uniform. Um, it was again, going back to it, it showed me that I belonged. It was, it was kind of like a, a welcome in and you're here to stay type moment because I was able to, to see that, you know, I'm in this building and I'm executing and I'm getting the the positive feedback that I'm wishing for. And um, and it was awesome. It was a, it was it was great to show them my physical abilities on the field. Um, the first. Pr- so basically the two weeks of practice squad that second or third week, I got the call on a Tuesday that, yeah, Brandon McManus is on the COVID list. Um, so that Tuesday afternoon, Coach McMahon and I going back and forth, he's like, look, man, Tomorrow's your day. Tomorrow's practice one, day one with the team. We'll have practice Wednesday, Thursday. We actually played Saturday. Um, so we had a, a Friday. It was kind of a walkthrough. So so Wednesday was my very first day actually with the full team. Um, so I was able to join the team because I was actually going to be the starting kicker for the upcoming week. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So so that night I get a, a text Tuesday night saying um, – from the from the the substance abuse, I guess, the, um, like for the, the drug testing for performance enhancing drugs, just as I'm trying to get a, a good night rest, um, some adequate sleep to prepare for arguably the biggest practice of my life. Now I have to wake up at 515 in the morning and show up for a 6 a.m. drug test. I guess f- no, for no particular reason, but I guess. I guess they do random tests that it's week. It's the guns, bro. Yeah, it was the it was something. I, don't, I was doing pull ups on the on the crossbar, and that must have been it. Um, so every week they drove whatever they get a few random guys. So I woke up first thing in the morning, had to get up, go take care of this drug test, sit around for two hours, 
um, go through a meeting and then get some food. And then we're going out to practice with the team. We're in the indoor facility. Uh, it was freezing outside. So luckily enough, we were able to kick in the indoor with the team. Um, so we had field goal period in the middle of practice. Field goal period consisted of 10 kicks, um, 10 field goals. That 10 kicks was arguably one of the best round of 10 kicks I ever put together in, in my life. It was awesome. Uh, I think I made the first seven um, beginning with like a closed field goal all the way back to like 43 yards, I believe. Um, I did miss my next kick maybe by four or five inches um, to the right of the upright, just pushed it, and then proceeded to make four kicks in a row all the way back to 57 yards. Um, and that's live snap hold kick. Boom, boom, boom. Was just drilling them, switching hashes, fast tempo, fast pace, getting getting acclimated to uh, you know the 1.3 to 1.2 operation time with the snapper and holder. And then, so when that ended, I'm walking off that field like, okay, I'm in. Let's let's go. Welcome to the NFL. That was incredible. This is just the beginning. This is what I've trained for. This is why I'm here. Um, and then we had a kickoff period. You know, probably I don't know, 20, 30 minutes later team kickoff period. So we get five kickoffs. We're in the indoor. I get it. We're in Denver. The first kick, the first four kickoffs went through the uprights. Um, the team couldn't even do the return. So it was essentially just me kicking the ball through the uprights. One of them hit the back wall. Um, we're working on coverage lanes and all that. Um, for me, I mean, I was told deep middle, let's see what you got. That This is it. So I went four kickoffs in a row through the uprights. The fifth one hit the crossbar. The returner caught it. They were able to take it up a little bit. Um, so at the end of practice, Coach Fangio brought me up to the entire team, gave me a brief introduction saying, you know, hey, you know, if anybody does not know, Brandon McManus is on the COVID list. This is Taylor Russellino. If he kicks anything like he did today, this guy's going to be around for a while. And not to mention the fact that he's Italian. So he loved that. And uh, so that kind of put me on the spotlight with the team. And in that moment, I mean, it was humbling. It was it was an honor. And going back to I know I kind of keep saying it, but it, but it was just another sense of, OK, I'm here and I belong here. Um, so that gave me the utmost confidence. And then Thursday we had a practice again. We actually didn't kick anything with the team. Um, so I had a few field goal reps with the snapper and holder, went outside, got some reps in Friday, didn't kick it all, shut it down. Um, so the game comes here. I am. I had one day of practice with the team. The game comes, the city of Denver is under a wind advisory. I'm like, are you kidding me? The two days before. So, so on that Thursday, not only did I wake up for the performance enhancing tests, go out to practice, had lunch, and then one of the guys in the organization organizations suggested that I grab a bag of balls, head down to Mile High Stadium, and get some kicks in by myself. To me, let's go. Um, I was excited. So, so I had my car. I, the equipment guy gave me the address. He's like, look, meet me here at the stadium. It was like 2 o'clock. So I drive over to the stadium, pull in, change, get a bag of balls. I, I took – I had the, that entire stadium, Mile High Stadium, to my entire self. I would sit on that 50-yard line, did a full 360, soaked in every moment of it, looked up, looked around. The field itself was so nice. It was like kicking on you know, a golf green, which is a luxury for any specialist out there. Um, so, so going into the stadium and seeing that was, again, awesome. Um, ended up hitting from 65 yards one way like 63 or 64 the other way it was 70 degrees sun was shining it was beautiful i was like this is what it's going to be like on saturday i'm more than ready well little did i know that saturday woke up denver had some some wind advisors we go out there for the game um playing buffalo um the game was awesome. I was, again, just waking up that morning, was thrilled to to be able to put that NFL logo on, walk into a locker room um, with some of the world's best athletes um, and compete. And and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go out there. I wanted to compete. I wanted to help my team get that win. Um, so we go out there for warm-ups. The punter, Sam Martin, looks at me. He's been in the league for a while. He looks at me. He's like, look, Taylor, I've been in this league, I think you said eight years, eight or nine years, and I've never seen anything like this. 
Um, in regards to the wind, um, the uprights were, I mean, there's a couple Twitter videos of the uprights going each and every way. I mean, you had one flag point one way, the other flag point the other way. Regardless, it was windy as heck. Warming up was a disaster. Trying to adjust the swing, trying to play the wind, draw fades. Um, it was just tough. So I, I, I wasn't really able to get my footing or not really footing, but just that confidence in like, all right, this game's going to be awesome. Um, so we finished warming up. We go in the locker room, get dressed. We're in that all orange, which looks so clean. Um, we go out there, game starts. Definitely weird having no fans in the stands. Um, about about 10,000 South Park cutouts in one of the end zones that were just flapping up and down the whole game. And uh, I guess yeah, it was probably within the first two minutes we walk out there for a 51-yard field goal. And honestly, when I walked out there for that field goal, it was it was a let's go moment. It was like a I'm born for this. This is what I've been training for. <clears throat> this is what I've dreamed of. It's, it's go time. Let's, let's execute. This is easy. I, I didn't, it didn't phase me one bit that it was a 51 yarder to start my NFL career. I went out there, approached that kick with every bit of confidence. Um, unfortunately the kick did not go my way. I pushed it. The wind was super, super strong in that direction going right to left. I unfortunately pushed it to the right. Didn't, um, didn't play it as, as well as I should have. But then again, if I go back to pregame, the wind in that direction and for that and, and how it was blowing, that same ball would have been good. So it was kind of tricky because it was like, you know, finding that that right alignment, that right adjustment throughout the game was something I obviously struggled with. Um, but that's part of the game. That's part of learning. I, I was thrown into, you know, not the most, you know, perfect conditions, but that's the NFL for you. I mean, I was out there to execute and I have to perform when given that opportunity. Um, so I missed a 51 yarder. We go back out there. Um, I think the next quarter, my first extra point attempt, make it, put it down, the, um, put it down the middle. There we go. First NFL point under my belt. <clears throat> so that was a great feeling. Um, Melvin Gordon scored the touchdown. I was honored to um, follow it up with the point after. And then, uh, and then proceeded to ha- to struggle on a couple other extra points, but in regards to, in regards to the game itself and the opportunity, um, I was just out there and tried my absolute best. Coach McMahon, Coach Fangio, they had every bit of confidence in me. And that goes back to that week of practice um, and every other week or every other day prior that Coach McMahon had watched me kick. So is what it is. You know, I mean, the game didn't go my way, but the uh, like I said, the other eight to 10 practices I was out there with that team, I showed each and every day that that I'm an NFL kicker, that I belong out there, that when given that opportunity, per se that I had in the XFL, you know, an opportunity to come out here in training camp, compete, build cohesion to get reps and then to go out there on game day. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind I could become a, you know, a top 10 kicker in the, in the national football league. And that's, and that's my goal. And and I'm still foot full throttle on that gas. And, and I'm a firm believer that that will be happening here soon. So. Me too. Um, Me too. Let's get hell, it. Hell yeah. Absolutely. man. <laughs> Yes, but it was sir. awesome. It was awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now it is time for our best dress segment of the show brought to you by Primo Tailors. Primo Tailoring brings anyone exclusive one of a kind designs that will allow them to optimize the most potential out of their outfits, out of their clothing, man. Let me tell you, Primo prides themselves on creating exclusive tailored clothing it's built super well so you don't have to spend more money. You know, saves you money because you don't have to buy it all the time. All at an affordable rate to begin with. Anyways, man, Lewis, the owner of Primo, he's reinvented my swag. He got me looking right for my wedding about a year ago, almost in March. It's crazy. Um, he could definitely help yours as well. Find them on Instagram at Primo Tailors or check out PrimoTailoring.com. Go hit him up. He's easy to work with. He'll get you looking right. We got to have it. With that being said, though, Taylor. What is your go-to game day fit? Um, I mean, I'm pretty casual. Me, I mean, I, I, you know, I'll throw on a nice pair of slacks with a, you know, a nice button up or, you know, maybe throw a nice watch on and just put a big smile on my face as I walk down in front of the fans. Um, I'm always kind of the one looking at who's looking more fresh or who's got some crazy, crazy outfit on today. And, uh, 
and being around some of these guys, you see a little bit of everything, but just looking sharp, man, looking sharp and uh, just giving me that confidence physically and mentally that, Hey, you look good, feel good, feel good, play good, play good, get paid good. It's kind of all one of the, right. No, that's, that's something like that. Yeah. Um, I think that's how it works. So, right. So, so that's Lewis, me. Lewis will get you looking good. Then you'll get paid good because you'll play good. That's I what like we're it. Saying. That's what we're I saying like here. <laughs> Who are you bumping to in pregame warmups? Um, honestly, so I'm not the biggest fan of, of headphones in my ears, although on the bus and cruising up to the stadium, um, I listen to everything from Dave Matthews, which is a little lower, you know, a little lower tone, a little more soft spoken compared to some like crazy rock music. So listen to Dave Matthews and I'll throw on a little bit of hip hop here and there, um, kind of just shuffle through. I, I don't have like a specific song or a specific order of songs, like a game day playlist that probably 90% of people do have. Um, but yeah, so I kind of like to keep it an even keel and uh, just get focused. Nice, nice. You love to see a nice little like mellow, nice little mellow tone, you know? <laughs> kind of nice. I have dudes who come in here, they're like, I got to listen to to music that's going to make me want to kill somebody. I'm just like, all right, right Sam. All right, man. Right, right. I mean, as a kicker, <laughs> I, I, can't get too, I can't get too aggressive on a – on what's Retrive the head. ball. Right. Retrive it. <laughs> put it. Put it through the uprights. <laughs> Facts. Who is the best athlete? This is tough, man, because you, you've already mentioned some great names in this in this podcast. Who is the best athlete you've ever played with and against in your career at any level? The best athlete. Like you said, there's definitely a handful of them. Um, one guy who kind of sticks out to me, not sure if anybody's going to really know who he is, Um I, when I played with the New Orleans Voodoo, we had a receiver, LJ Castile. Um, he had a couple – I think he played at University of Houston, had a couple NFL shots, um, very talented enough to play in the NFL. But this guy was unbelievable. I remember him making – like every game was making like one or two-handed – one or two one-handed catches in the arena football outside of the wall in the back corner of the end zone. I mean, he was a physical specimen. He could jump. He could run. He could catch anything. Um, so he's certainly one of them. And then and, um, in regards to the NFL, because obviously I played against some of those guys. I mean, watching Josh Allen move at his size and ability was something that I, I was – I mean, I guess actually being on the field with these guys on game day in full speed and seeing them perform their craft – at the size, at the physical statute that they are, was unbelievable. So Josh Allen is a, is a hell of an athlete and bright future for that guy. Nice. Nice. <laughs> what is the biggest piece of adversity you've had to overcome, whether it's in your personal life or on the football field, and how did you do so? Um, I mean – let's let's go football-wise. I mean, I, I'd say the biggest piece of adversity was was – the end of that NFL game, just, just seeing, seeing myself not perform to the level that I know I'm capable of kind of took me, you know, and, and then, you know, everybody, you know, obviously the people you surround yourself with friends, family, everybody's asking, you know, what happened? Why, why, why this, why that, you know, how nervous were you? Were you nervous? What was it? This, was it this, was it that, you know? And, um, and I mean, I guess, you know, it, it certainly wasn't me being nervous that day, but, not talking about the whole story again, but, it, you know, facing the adversity of that outcome to learn from that, um, to take it, to take the positives out of that day and, and to build upon those moving forward um, is which is it has been huge for me. So we're about a year ago from that. Um, and in the past 12 months, I have tremendously, you know, put every bit of effort into a getting back into the NFL and then B making sure that when I get there, I execute to perfection. Um, so facing that adversity, facing the the negative outcome of that game, taking the positives from it and then building from that, setting myself up for future success is, uh, is probably the biggest thing I had to do football wise. Um, so, yeah. Nice. And one last question for you, Taylor. You've been outstanding today, man. This is an incredible story. Uh, what kind of advice can you pass along to the younger generation out there? 
just keep working. You know, one of my big things is uh, like no matter what, take that from my uh, my father's kind of always preach that to me and just keep working. If, if it's what you want, if, if it's what you know, you personally know you're capable of doing. No reason to stop, no reason to um, to change direction, stay focused, put the work in, you know, trust in God's plan, because I'm a firm believer that that he has he has the plan laid out and, and it's out there for us all, each and every one of us, no matter what it is. So stay focused, stay humble and, um, you know, make sure every day you wake up with goals in mind and, and you do everything you can that day to to prepare for those goals to when it comes time to execute that you execute. So just never give up and keep going no matter what, no matter what. That's that's it for me, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What? Where can we uh, find you out on social media? Um, I'm on Instagram, um, Twitter, and then on YouTube. TG Russellino, I believe, is my Instagram and Twitter tag. So TG and then my last name. So pretty simple. Um, don't have a Facebook. Don't have a TikTok. So those three. I've uh, I've kicking videos on YouTube for for ten years. So. Some of these coaches who are looking for film, I, I don't know how they miss it because it's it's right to, it's at the, the tip of their fingertips. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Taylor Russolino, thank you so much for hopping on the show today, my man. Uh, I think I can speak for everybody who's tuned in today and, and is watching that we're all super excited for your journey, man. Uh, we can't wait to see how it all plays out. And if I had to bet my entire life on it, man. I, I think we got you back in the league here in the next few years, man. Cause you have a work 100%. ethic like, like no other man. So uh, 100%. Yep. I'm super I'll, I'll excited be back. for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much for hopping on the show today. And uh, for all you guys who are watching this brand new, you can find this podcast anywhere. You listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple podcasts, the whole nine yards. Make sure y'all check it out there. Once again, Taylor Russolino. Thank you so much for hopping on the show today. Yes, sir. Thank you.